Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Heather, for inviting us. We're very glad to be here and share with you our thoughts and approaches, and um, be very curious also about your impact. Um, our laboratory Berlin, Chris and me, we co-founded this in 2006. We are interested, to make it short, in reflecting about the 21st century and find interesting artists that can give us an answer to that. And we think art and science is a very important interrelation, a very important step in um, uh, discourse and uh, dialogue we have to strengthen. And in Berlin, um, we have an interesting crowd, a Berlin crowd, an international crowd. In the last few years, we tend to work in series. So we want to spread the dialogue over one year about a certain topic of what we think is belonging to current issues. So we had, uh, we work sometimes with open calls, with numerous st studio visits, but we had series such as Time and Technology. We had artists uh, shown in uh, series such as Synesthesia, because we were convinced that the multisensory perception is very much um, connecting to our current way of life. We also had an international conference. You can see everything on our website. Every 15 contributions in English, everything is on, available. And also, and this is what we would like to show you and share with you tonight, we had an, a one series, you can see this here, Macro Microbiologies, an exhibition series. That was our last one from 2014 and 15. And in the end, in the summer this year, we were happy to produce a book as a post-production. Also, uh, that was very important to us to strengthen the 11 artistic positions and to put more theory to them. And we would just like to um, go a few of these positions and uh, also a little bit more thoroughly in a few um, chosen positions and uh, discuss them or reflect them with you. We, maybe you're surprised when we talk about biologies, but um, this neologism we favor to use for our, for our discussion um, because the life sciences are marked by a plurality of disciplines, ecology, botany, comparative zoology, biotechnology, biochemistry, microbiology, etc. So, we worked with this neologism. And our idea, our curatorial idea for the four group shows was to come from the vast to the minute. So we really took the content as a curatorial concept and we worked from the biosphere to organisms, to bacteria, to the molecule. And um, very important is also to say that not only the artworks were shown, but we very favored always the dialogue. We had artist talks, we had workshops, we had um, uh, seminars going on to strengthen our dialogue and as much as we could with a really broad um, public. So starting with the first exhibition, Microbiology is one, Biosphere, it was in spring in 2014, um, we had an Austrian artist, Matthias Kessler, uh, who works with nature, but very ironically with nature. Here, the Everglade pictures that we just saw uh, was basically uh, 3D over juxtaposition of software to re question what humans think nature might be, whereas what you see here in the inside of the exhibition space, but also a little bit on the street. But you see here, it was more than eight meters wide uh, of um, what is called mountain top removal, the mining industry. And he had this aerial view with the help of a vented plane that he used to, to, to take or to use for uh, having uh, to achieve the landscape of this devastating environmental uh, 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 issue in West Virginia. He wanted to, achieve, to, to get hold of this, kind of this landscape uh, by land, but uh, the, the company was not very um, keen on letting him go. So 
what is actually very much in the tradition of land art is um, what we have here in the 21st century um, connected also to um, current issues of um, pollution, if you want to say like that. And he actually decided a very monumental aesthetics of more than eight meters wide. Alexandra Tolman is an American artist, and also interesting, she is a soil uh, specialist in science and an artist, and we have some of our artists uh, in personal union, both as scientists and artists, and she made an interesting piece um, connected to the Berlin soil and also the concretization, uh, so basically where not nature is in Berlin, but um, closed soil, and she used our neighborhood actually in uh, Berlin Valley where our galleries are and um, used also an atlas uh, of uh, urban geography of the city of Berlin and uh, combined text and um, and the geography. A lot of documentation I just to give you an overview I hope you find this okay I will not go so much into depth we go later on in other positions a little bit more into depth. We have also uh, had the pleasure to work with a Mexican artist, uh, Katja Gadea Brown, very, very interesting artist. She's very much working at the intersection of nature, art, and also cultural history, and uh, works and has produced interesting video works on the theme of corn and also on the theme of water in Mexico City. Uh, if I just allow me quickly to say what we saw earlier in the video, uh, she was um, reflecting about the catastrophical situation of a lack of water in Mexico City, whereas once upon a time the city was originally grounded as a city of islands with lots of water streets. Um, also, um, she made um, very impressive videos on corn, um, and um, also thinking about the pre-colonial way of um, agriculture um, in juxtaposition with the 21st century of agriculture. But as well, this is also what we find very important that um, we are not interested only to document, but we very much are fond, and this is positions that we chose with a very strong aesthetics um, next to the content. Let me go a little bit closer into what you see here, the Center for Post-Natural History, uh, with uh, Rich Pell as one of the founders in Pittsburgh. Um, fascinating, with this installation that you see here, maybe as a sort of a, um, uh, which you just saw, the, the brown box, maybe seemingly more a classical museum in the museum. Um, it very much uh, refers to life forms that have been int intentionally altered by humans through domestication, selective breeding, and genetic engineering. That's why they came up and very ironically, playfully, with the term post-natural. Um, towards this end, the Center for Post-Natural History produces thematic multimedia exhibitions, they are printed works, but they also let tour um, works within Europe. And uh, what you see here is the artwork called Post-Natural Organisms of the European Union. And uh, it is actually a collection of European specimens altered by human intervention. So a large circular wooden structure contains a film screen and 11 dioramas, what you just saw, um, where the visitors can study a preserved red canary have a look at a transgenic mosquito developed to flight, fight malaria, or learn about the South Svalbard seed vault in northern Norway. With the help of telephones, the visitors receive short factual information on each of the specimens represented. <coughs> um, we were, of course, fascinated with the idea of this dialogue and the idea of making a sort of a museum in the museum. And uh, maybe this is also um, noteworthy to say that 
um, we brought a rich pal in the Central Post National History in 2013 in spring to um, the Natu Natural History Museum in Berlin, the Naturkunde Museum, and which that was a really interesting move and uh, show, which was a little bit like um, hacking in the museum, because this show in the Naturkunde Museum was not so much clear for all the visitors there because he worked with the specimens in that museum and the showcase of his exhibition was very similar to the showcases in general. Um, so he was not only a double agent as an artist or curator but inserting the installation in a remarkably smooth and camouflaged manner within the Natural History Museum. Um, he was literally able to hack the museum so that was actually parallel to our position here. A skull of a dog, since it has all to do with breeding. And then we had um, the second exhibition of microbiology's um, organisms with three artistic positions. Susan Anker and uh, Maya Smreka and uh, Brandon Ballanger. And I'd like to go a little bit more into the position of Susan Anker. And after this, I will give the microphone over to my partner, Chris, to continue. Uh, so we had this in spring, summer, this show, the second one of four. And uh, with Suzanne, uh, she contributed several works. She also produced a new work. And um, whereas um, the reflecting about the biosphere, the first exhibition was, as the name says, was more or less um, a broader reflection on microbiology, whereas then the reflection of organisms with uh, artworks like um, astroculture, which I will explain in a little while, it was more specific, and um, we could um, explain Suzanne Anker's position in all the positions of the 11 chosen artists as uh, reading the aesthetics of science. So Suzanne is very knowledgeable about art history, and coming to the Vanitas project, you will understand how much she is uh, referring to the whole history of art, and, uh, and also the, the term of nature in the history of art. Um, astroculture shelf life, it's a work that is already six years old, but I mean, she erects the work newly and newly, and in Berlin we had this piece, it's actually three shelves put on the wall. Um, it consists of three plant chambers with installed LED panels and seed pods are planted inside, and by means of the red, blue UV lights, the plants which was in our case, peas and beans, oregano and mint, they all appear foxia, like pink. The concept of this process-oriented work foresees regularly watering and mainly dark space. The work may manifest the possibility of growing herbs in any light-deprived space. And the situation, our exhibition space was really fantastic because uh, except the opening hours, we had the shades down and it was really dark. Whereas this uh, astro shelves was on, the LED lights were, was on. And um, the term astroculture derives from the NASA Space Development Program with the apt trademark label Advanced Astroculture, ADDASC experimenting with different forms of gravity and extreme conditions for plants' growth in space since 2001. Anker's works reads itself like a critical commentary on NASA's rhetoric, especially NASA's targets for the future. And I just want to quickly quote NASA's mission to maybe counterplay with her installation. How can industry take advantage of growing plants in the unique microgravity environment created as the International Space Station orbits Earth? The Wisconsin Center for Space Automation and Robotics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and NASA Commercial Space Center with partners in industry and academia is dedicated to help industry explore the possibilities. And, quote.
the remote sensing. That's an interesting um, work from 2013. Um, you see these little objects in petri dishes. And you probably are all eager to know what material this is. It's not plants. It maybe has this biomorphic structure, but it's basically 3D prints. And it refers to Avanita's um, work, which I come back later on. Um, let me just show you this new, this was the very new work that she produced for our show, Patrice Panoply. It was over 100 petri dishes combined both organic and synthetic materials, candle, wax, garlic, noodles, feathers, and beetles, etc. Uh, jelly, baby cherries, red cheese, etc. I think I don't have to sum them all up. Um, and the haptic and textual qualities of the objects meticulously arranged in a clear color scheme emphasize the wish to observe. And in this work, and this is what we actually summed up in our publication, I just quote, uh, as in so many other works by Anker, one comes upon the combination of living and dead materials, the dichotomy of synthetic and organic, of artificial and natural, I mean natural in quotations, as much as it is still possible at all to use the term in the age of biotechnology. And so Anker says, and that makes very much sense in our discussion, I consider the Petri dish as a signifier who is currently researching, she's currently researching the history of the Petri dish. And uh, I also coming from art history, I was very much thinking about the object trouvé. And uh, before I give over to Chris for our next artistic positions, I just wanted to show you here um, uh, two of many works by Suzanne Anker that is an ongoing series and it has to do, it goes before the remote census. This is a series called Vanitas in a Petri dish from 2013. And here she reflects the historical concept of Vanitas from an extraordinary perspective, the Petri dish. So eggs, flowers, pearls, dead frogs, feathers, cloths, honeycomb, etc. are differently combined in Petri dishes. The superimposed size of each image provides a forensic gaze onto this post-baroque syntax. The square format of the photographs stresses the circle from of the Petri dish even more and automatically recalls the centuries-long discourse of square and circle. Anchor reconsiders the art historical notion of vanitas and therefore employs the Petri dish, a quote, as the site of laboratory life in which the Petri dish changes from an object of science to an object of saturated as art. So that was another exhibition space where you can see to anchors work, and in the back there will be then Brenton Ballinger, and then I want to give my uh, the microphone over to Chris, my partner. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, in this exhibition, it's interesting also because the anchors really one of the first artists to really work together with biologists and to reflect on biology in let's say starting from the 1970s onward. Uh, and there were two other artists. Uh, one was Brandon Ballinger, who started working in the 90s. Uh, he studied both uh, uh, art and biology, and so he's also working as a biologist, as a herpetologist, his speciality of frogs and other amphibians, uh, especially frogs and uh, their deformities. Uh, you could say that it's a bad mixed metaphor, but the frog as a canary in the coal mine, uh, it, you know, being that it lives in the water throughout its life, uh, and certainly the water is maybe the most sensitive part of our ecology. Uh, so he uh, would, actually goes out and studies um, how many frogs in a particular lake or pond have deformed limbs. And then he also tries to find out why they have deformed limbs and what the ecosystem is that does it, you know, agricultural runoff, industrial runoff, and so on. And uh, he does this in part with uh, performances. And uh, uh, where he actually does the research with people from the public. He invites the public to come in to collect frogs with him. And one second, yeah. 
not the Lacan, but it's uh, cry of silent forms. But what he does is he has the public, invites the public to come and collect the frogs. They learn about their ecology. Then he takes uh, some of the more extreme examples and uh, he does a cleaning, clearing, and staining uh, system where he can tell from what kind of deformity it is, from whether it's cartilage or uh, bone. And then he, these, uh, that he does as a scientist, but then he does a high resolution scan and makes images from that which are exhibited in galleries. Also, uh, one of the theories was is that there were predators uh, creating a lot of these deformities. For instance, dragonfly larvae uh, tend to grab a bit of a tadpole, eat a little bit off, and let it go. And so he, uh, uh, as a scientist, duplicated this in the lab, and he filmed this. And the films, you know, some certain parts of the film were useful in the scientific uh, reason, but he had other films which were quite amazing and were, uh, scientifically useless, but perhaps uh, artistically, aesthetically, existentially fascinating. Uh, and it's a work called Cry of Silent Forms, uh, seven videos uh, that you see here. And um, you know, one of the last dying breaths of a frog, or a tadpole's cannibalizing one of, uh, one of them, uh, one of their mates or something. Yeah. And the other work we did, which is pretty bad in this case, but uh, it's okay, um, was uh, also a, this uh, thing here is uh, a work. This is kind of uh, what he does with frogs usually. In this case, it's with salamanders. It was a, a limited edition print. Usually, he only does one print, but in this case, a limited edition print uh, for uh, uh, raising money for a program called SOS Salamander in the Netherlands. He did some research in the Netherlands uh, on frogs and actually found a, a location that had 95% of the frogs had deformations. It was a collapsing colony. But at the same time, the, uh, I was talking with herpetologists and they have a, a plague uh, that's decimating the fire salamander population. They've been taking ones that uh, uh, were not, uh, uh, did not have this plague and taking them to a zoo, basically preventing them from getting the plate, but the, to raise money for this, he uh, made this print, which was also on exhibition. The third artist in this show was, uh, uh, you could say, a younger generation, someone who's maybe been active in bioart the last five to six years, Maya Sprakar. And with Maya, it's fascinating. She, uh, if Brandon is a scientist, Maya concentrates a lot of work on cooperation with scientists. So this is a work uh, that she developed uh, and has shown it in two formats. Uh, one in Slovenia, and uh, it's basically a, a tent in double aquarium for studying uh, the effects of invasive species, in this case, crayfish. And uh, a, the story started in Slovenia when she was talking to some local biologists who were working with uh, an invasive species problem. A, uh, uh, a, in a farm of making a, uh, raising aquarium animals, it was raising tropical Australian crayfish, uh, Cherax quad, and they were um, uh, normally they, it, a whole bunch of these got loose, as did some other specimens, and uh, into a lake Toplo, which would have to be near where Maya is from in Slovenia. And normally they would have died in the winter, but Lake Toplo is fed by thermal springs. So they survived. And one thing they noticed, there are no European crayfish. So she built this structure, and she had the Australian crayfish on one side and the, um, uh, s uh, and the European on the other. And they could cross over this kind of bridge on top, which in Slovenia they did, and the Australians uh, ate up some of the European ones. So, uh, it was an interesting uh, kind of experiment. The scientists said it was not quite scientifically accurate for a study, but they were also very fascinated with the results would be. Uh, and she did not want to do the show this in Berlin because it was connected to the Slovene ecology. So she we put her in touch with a, a comparative zoologist who was a crustacean specialist in uh, Berlin. And she created, uh, there was also this problem of the European, all the invasive species in Germany are from North America. They also carry uh, a virus which kills European crayfish. And so it was decided they wouldn't do that. 
the lakes fall off the European crayfish. That was a really brutal way. Yeah. So they, she chose two invasive species that are invasive in Germany. One is all over Europe and introduced in the 19th century. It's kind of the original uh, invasive, invasive crayfish. It's uh, the Louisiana crayfish, Procambrus clarki, uh, named after William Clark from Lewis and Clark fame. And um, uh, you know, it was brought over for as a food, as a, you know, be, to be raised for cooking. And the other uh, is a related one, but it was took a scientist and for about 10, 15 years were curious where this new invasive uh, crayfish, which was everywhere from um, from Japan to Italy to Germany to Madagascar, was from. And uh, the end up the result ends up being uh, Florida. It's actually also a uh, Procombrus, Procombrus phallax. Uh, but all the ones they're finding in different countries were only female. They, outside of Florida, there are no male Procombrus phallax. The Procombrus phallax, they call it forma virginalis, uh, reproduces asexually um, through, uh, with, um, uh, you know, so basically a kind of a self cloning. And uh, so people would buy this for their aquarium, and a year later they would have 60 or so crayfish, and, and of course some of them would get flushed and end up in the local e ecosystem because they would survive. And that's why they're all around the world. And what she did is she had uh, the Clarkie on one side and the Phallic Spirginalis on the other side, uh, and to see if they would cross over. Theoretically, they're the same genus, so they could possibly procreate, but as far as we know, they didn't, though some of the females did clone themselves. And that was uh, the third piece we did in the show. Uh, it, here's one of the Kabakis, so ah. very beautiful looking ones. Uh, our interns would say that the females were very ugly. Uh, the, that's the blue one is the marble, marble, the marble crayfish or Bogamus phallax. Uh, last few is, is at the back side of the uh, 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 installation. So she sees this also as kind of prototype uh, for the future for investigating invasive species, a kind of mobile do-it-yourself laboratory. Uh, now, uh, this idea of also uh, artists working with scientists, artists being scientists, uh, we decided uh, uh, to carry on a project that was proposed to us by two young curators in, uh, um, in Berlin, Desiree Foster and Daniela Silvestrine, which was a workshop with the London-based collective Sea Lab. So Howard Hall and Denora Echinti. Uh, and this was really interesting because it was, um, uh, they were offering um, a, for 18 people, a workshop on basically how to make glow in the dark bacteria, GFP bacteria. Uh, and Howard, for his particular, is very, is there on the, uh, on the right, uh, it is very particular also about a lot of art that claims to be synthetic biology but isn't. You know, maybe better defined as um, speculative design or kind of skirts around it. And, uh, but he also wanted to bring out uh, this experience of the science to non-scientists. I think in the group there were two people who had done biology or biochemistry, but the other 16 were uh, there's an English professor from Penn State who was writing a book on uh, several uh, also artists who were taking part. Also, there were uh, this was done in collaboration with a local iGEM team, so young biology students who were they're setting up for uh, the contest in Cambridge, uh, International Genetic Engine Machines. They won a, a medal in it. And there were some nice synergies there uh, to bring it together. I think this is in the lab. The final part had to be done in the level two lab. And uh, so it was a really nice synergy between the local uh, students and the, their advisor and artists, and also kind of a non-science public learning how to do synthetic biology. And that was a nice seek into our uh, third exhibition last year, The Bacterial Sublime, uh, with Anna Dimitri this year. Uh, it was really nice, it was as a, a, um, a kind of introduction of her work to a Berlin audience uh, in the front room. Uh, you could say kind of mini retrospective, and uh, so starting off with this work, which was her bed and chair floor, uh, basically coming from 
um, images from an electron microscope of uh, bacteria and found on her on this chair in this case, and then she sculpted in the images. And uh, the crochet piece is based on uh, things found in her bed. And you could do also collaborative work, you could add to it. Uh, and another work, the communication bacteria dress, which is also kind of inspiration for uh, upcoming pro uh, pro uh, projects, this idea that bacteria um, communicate among one another. Um, they make decisions, they form uh, cora. Uh, a biologist yesterday was telling me about bacteria that decide uh, for instance, if a, uh, a, bac uh, a bacteria will feel that if there's a big threat coming on, they will put a signal in with the other bacteria, and then they will all form a kind of spore that could remain dormant for thousands of years. Well, in the case of this dress, uh, she had a genetically modified bacteria that turned color when it formed the cora, but it also disappeared. So there was this, in a way, performative element that the, the piece occurred and the dress at the end had stains in it, but a lot of the original coloring had changed during it. Uh, and so it was captured on um, uh, on video and video mapped to this dress. And so there was both the, the dress and the uh, projection on the dress that showed the action of the bacteria kind of performing their cora. And another work here, uh, MRSA quilt, uh, where she worked with uh, microbiologists and doctors in a consortium of uh, um, modernizing medical microbiology. And uh, the, the, sorry, I should have stopped on it earlier, but the quilt is literally uh, uh, she put fabric inside uh, petri dishes and uh, with antibiotics and something spoke antibiotics and. Uh, as they grow, the blue stain was the MP Staphylococcus aureus, so-called MRSA, and the um, antibiotic white strips is, is a functioning antibiotic. Uh, it's actually kind of a test they would do without the fabric if they were trying to treat MRSA and see which antibiotic would work best since it is partially, you know, it's antibiotic resistant. Uh, this is a work she created for the exhibition that has to do with the history of um, antibiotics. So. One of the first antibiotics, a sulfur drug Prontosil, developed by Gerhard Domek in Berlin in the 30s, based on the work of uh, Paul Ehrlich. And um, uh, she does a kind of cultural history of it, the scientific history, but then she also, uh, it was, came from a, uh, a dye. And so she literally uses the Prontosil as a dye on the sculpture, which we'll see shortly. Um, the consultation. It was also used, uh, I think it was tested to be used against uh, uh, tuberculosis, which is kind of the ongoing theme after this in the back room. Um, some of you probably may have seen the show at Watermans last year. Uh, well, part of that came to Berlin, and we were very glad to show that as well. So the romantic disease is a kind of cultural and scientific history of tuberculosis. So if you've read The Magic Mountain, this is Blaue uh, Heinrich, W. Henry for coughing into, uh, uh, that was, uh, and this is a pneumothorax machine which was used up until the mid-century to uh, collapse lungs so the lungs would have a rest, uh, kind of a, uh, a cure that may have been fatal in many cases. So. The final exhibition we had uh, was Johanna Hoffmann, Proteo. And she's, uh, she really goes down to the molecular level. She works with molecular biologists. And uh, I mean, I guess she could use electron microscope imaging, but she basically takes data and visualizes it. And she also has a very big interest in physics and in string theory. Um, and she um, combines the two. For her, the forms of protein uh, the way they fold in uh, is already a kind of uh, macrocosm, microcosm, metaphor, microcosm, super microcosm metaphor for, uh, uh, for theoretical physics. 
And so, uh, and a lot of the works are made with, uh, to be seen in 3D, like this work, Molecules, here, uh, was a 3D projection. So it's a bit hard to um, document it, it comes close to it. This is a smaller work that was part of the exhibition, Pepper's Ghost, uh, an early forerunner of, uh, of holography. Uh, so it's basically an image, four images put together on an inverted pyramid. And as she, maybe a little bit of description of how she describes uh, her connection to the connection of physics. According to superstring theory, our universe contains extra dimensions compacted to the subatomic level and hidden from our limited perception. If so, our, body, our own bodies carry dimensions inaccessible to our perception. We are spaces comprising manifold universes. But the evolution of our universe could follow the opposite direction. Uh, according to other theories, the multidimensional, multidimensional world collapses into a four-dimensional one, and even this one can be, like a hologram, a perceptual illusion. Uh, this work also connects a lot to her idea of dimensions. Uh, and again, she uses this trope of a 3D imaging over two to think of a further why, uh, why. In connection with this uh, exhibition, uh, we had a library where we actually showed the, this film uh, and had all the a lot of the books we did for research and books from the artists and so forth. So it was also having that, an additional um, educational level beyond a set of workshops and talks that we were doing throughout. And now let's see if I can put it back because I wanted to leave something from the beginning for the very end. And this was a project we started off the series off in the January of 2014. It was uh, working together with a uh, young biologist, Rudy Petroyo, who's founding a biotinkering a file in Berlin. He's also a member of Hacteria, some of you may know uh, as I think one of the founders of Hacteria, Andy Gracie is based in London. Uh, and Rudiger uh, uh, is currently trying to form an open lab, wet lab in Berlin, uh, ideally eventually level two, to work both for biologists and artists together. Uh, and this was a, a program we made with him uh, of talks, biohacking, uh, this was a presentation uh, by Teresa Schubert, together with Andy Adamatsky from the University of West England. Here are people, students from Graz who have an open bio lab. It's one of our interns learning. Uh, it was, you know, it was quite well visited from the public. People, you know, would come in and have questions and learn and do a little bit of biohacking. And there was a lecture series. I think one of the most interesting was Denise Kara, also connected with Hacketeria and Rüdiger as well, they're talking about a, a project connected for schools around the world to um, uh, do research in looking for soil bacteria uh, for new antibiotics. And the idea would be um, that it would be a great program for teaching students how to do uh, testing but, uh, uh, and how to work in the laboratory. But you, you can in the process find uh, you uh, find possible future antibiotics, and it kind of works in the pyramids, the upward pyramid of any successful results are sent to a higher three university, and then if they're duplicated into another university, and at the end, to, uh, the final step would be uh, there was a Chinese university that agreed that anything that was proven then could be made into an open source or a, a non copyright uh, antibiotic. Uh, so, anyway, to kind of a, a uh, a series of different uh, <coughs> programs beyond the exhibitions that we try to do whenever it's possible as well. Um, and so this is kind of a summary of, of one project we did that lasted altogether about 18 months between late 2013 and the beginning of this year. And, um, yeah, I guess if you have any questions, uh, Ricky and I can answer. If we will bring our daughter in because we're traveling uh, along, uh, so she can come up as well. And we'll see her. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to indulge and start with one question and then open up to the floor. Um, so, 
great to see such an array of works and, and you get you know, this, the sense of the curatorial through the works that you're selecting and the way you're presenting. And there's a huge amount of process and research and collaboration in all the works that you've shared today. And a lot of that doesn't manifest itself in the finished artwork that people just exhibit for. And I wanted to ask how you manage that curatorially. And do you let the, the, the work speak for itself with and lose that narrative of the process? Or are there other strategies that you employ to bring that the process um, to bear for the public? Well, we uh, we do start with a framework, a kind of theoretical framework, uh, and that makes us choose some art. You know, there are artists we made, didn't choose for this exhibition, but we've uh, been able to work with them this year between series and doing uh, separate projects. Uh, but once we've chosen the artists, we're very much working going from the work outward. In Germany, there's this big hype about a new curating which as far as I can tell from Anson Franco or Beatrice and Bismarck is kind of like the curator being artistically, you know, having artistic license or, or whatever, but we're much more interested in what we call uh, inductive curating and we work outward and we pull our attention for that. Yeah. In German we would say um, Werk immanentes Arbeiten is sort of like an immanent way of working, so you come from the artwork, you unfold the artwork as much as is possible and so basically you give credit to the artwork. I mean, of course, we choose artwork that we are totally convinced that they're noteworthy. And then we want to unfold the theory out of the artwork. Not We don't want to take the theory and, and just cover it over the artwork, so just um, supplementary or like secondary artworks as sort of a replacement for something and then just only follow the theory. Um, it means we also want to deal with a lot of theory and references, but we want to come to them through the artwork. That's why we, we sort of, because we, everyone asks us, uh, how do you call them your interesting way of curatorial concepts? And then we thought maybe it's sort of, a, can call it inductive curating. Thank you. And the relationship between the activities, the laboratory processes, and the, the educational participatory work, how, how do you? describe the relationship between that activity and the exhibition activity? Well, it, it comes from often the artists, so it comes from conversation with them, uh, an offer of some artists just prefer to give a talk, and some say, no, I'd like to do a workshop, uh, and then some of them just to do a workshop, so they're, you know, in that particular time and place, interested in that solely, and what was interesting with um, the DIY biologists, we're working with a biologist, and he's also very aware, he worked as a uh, scientific advisor for Ars Electronica, uh, also rather open, part of, kind of trying to make a, a, a DIY scene in, in Germany, but based on one that's you know, the Hacketeria project, which is international. And um, so, you know, we talked and he made suggestions and I kind of made suggestions. You know, it all kind of came together from uh, uh, you know, that, that idea and we also saw this as a different format. It was three days in two evenings, and it had its uh, incredible room Yeah, and again, also concerning the educational project, not to smell to this place here too much. It, um, she shows it. Um, yeah, also it, it caught, um, regarding the, the educational program that we want, and we, we had very we have, um, we, how do you say this in English, um, we treasure the, uh, a lot of edu education. And in Germany, I don't know, in the UK it's probably different, but in Germany, unfortunately, art education is a very negative connotation. It's about the arts, theory, and then Kunst, Pädagogik. And I think uh, if you don't think about the art education, an important um, a sphere is getting lost. So you cannot only curate, throw an, a show in the world and then after the opening night it's gone. No, there's another part of work that starts. And uh, the art education has, is also very closely linked to, uh, to the exhibition, basically. So we also want to unfold the seminars or the talks or the, the workshops out of the, the artworks that we show. Okay, I've got thousands more questions, but I'm going to open this up. Um, if we, for the camera, because we're filming it, if I can 
if people that have questions, if you can wait for the mic, that would be great. It is attached, but it has a long lead. So who would like to ask a question? Who would like to start? Um, this is my test home. Maybe Amina can help me with that. <laughs> Hello. 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 Hi, I'm, um, I'm an artist who works with scientists myself and I was interested in something that you said with regards to um, the scientists that artists you've encountered um, have worked with who have been fascinated with the results of the work but not considered it scientific enough to, to use in their own research. But I'm interested in that balance between their fascination and their interest in wanting to see the outcomes of artistic practice, and I wondered if you had any more to say about that. Well, I don't have the specifics, I don't know, the, I don't mind to telling us about that, uh, and I guess the it may probably have to do with maybe the, the size and limitation and the fact that it's an aquarium, and just as uh, as Brandon had uh, create, wanted to prove that dragonfly larvae uh, attack and eat uh, but don't kill uh, uh, tadpoles, and that might lead to deformations. Uh, he did that, but he had also made it a very controlled situation, and perhaps a, a, an environment that was close enough to the actual one. And this A-frame thing was, uh, from the point of view of the scientists in Ljubljana, not accurate enough to a real situation to prove that the Cherax were eating the Astacus Astacus, the Australian crayfish were eating them in Lake Topla, uh, but they were very curious uh, to what would happen, and they were very interested in the results, and I think it led them on to do more research on their own. Um, you know, but I think also the point of, of uh, uh, Maya wasn't to prove that, it was to, uh, to bring into a public kind of knowledge and experience of uh, invasive species in a local area, and, uh, but also you know, have this situation where people could interact with it, and maybe build a kind of inter interestingly designed aesthetic where people could relate to it. It's almost like a little tent you go, or medium-sized tent you go into. Uh, so uh, it, you know, it brings the science out in a different way in the exhibition space to a different public, and creates different uh, reactions. Uh, and uh, you know, it's the same. I, I, we, in, you know, I was we're at the uh, in the Humboldt University in the cellar where they have a raising their marble crayfish. And it's not a very aesthetic situation. And it, you're, when the science is talking to you, it's fascinating. But you know, if you just showed that, if he wasn't there, you'd be like, okay, there's a bunch of crayfish and tanks. Meanwhile, in her space, you know, it, it drew out a lot, a lot of people and a lot of fascination. Uh, the one thing I, I would say is I, I'm, I'm personally really interested in the reactions from uh, this, this collaboration between artists and scientists. Uh, I think you know, there's been a kind of a turn in it, there maybe in a more postmodern situation, it was the scientists to see maybe just as somebody who can help the artist deal with the problem and coming to a result. And what I see with uh, uh, you know art artists from in the last twenty years are a lot of uh, and then especially in the last ten years a lot of collaborations where the artist finds it very important to learn the science, to do the science and to understand it really in depth. And uh, you know, it, it makes the works, in my opinion, much deeper. You know, even if it's not, you know, you might not think it does from the result that's exhibited, but it does uh, create this depth. Uh, and the biologist I talked to yesterday was also saying how he was influenced in his research from working together with artists. So there's, uh, there we could go, but there are multiple layers of um, of influence and, and more of a purpose. It's I think art has more to offer to science than just the communication ability. Uh, but maybe a lot of scientists wouldn't want to admit it, but some do. Uh, and that's, I think, a theme for a future project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions?
Okay. Um, yeah, my name's Dr. I'm actually on the MS uh, Art Theory and Philosophy uh, program over here. Um, I was interested, you talked about the public, um, or publics, I guess, that um, are interested in the work that you're doing. How, how much is it a specialist audience? Uh, how much is it uh, focusing towards the university, focused towards business or commerce, and potentially? You know, the commercialization itself of it. And how much are you sort of like looking towards maybe children um, or towards you know, engagement with schools or engagement with the, you know, the public, public, so to speak? Thanks. Yeah, that's an interesting question, which also brings us to serious uh, reflections of how do you put up a show to reach as much as audience as you can. Uh, sometimes it's easy to, to to put up a show, and if you only address a certain particular um, uh, group uh, of the society. So we found out that we have visitors. Um, of course, it, it it depends on if you have the macrobiologies or the microbiologies, and so specifically to the certain scientific uh, subject that we address with the artistic works. Um, we had um, specific scientists visiting the show, but all in all, we have a very broad public. Uh, also, from the age-wise, it goes um, goes very young um, and uh, very high. And uh, we try to reach uh, students, uh, classes, and schools, but also a general public. I just wanted to say something also about curatorial work. Um, we have developed a uh, certain material which we offer the public and we call them source books. I mean, they're just folders that we laid out next to publications, next to our texts, next to the flyers, etc. It was just an offer. And we discovered that, uh, it was our great pleasure, we discovered that it was um, used a lot. Visitors stayed an hour or two hours and really used the source book. And in the source book we put broad general information about the artist, about uh, the topic of the exhibition, and then about the specific topic of each um, uh, artwork or, or artist is working with. And you saw it's really broad um, context wide range of macro microbiological references. We try to use specific, also enter in the source book um, specific texts, starting with broad texts and then specific texts uh, from uh, publications from Nature and, and other texts. So we just wanted to reach a um, specialized public, but also a broad public. So in the best sense of the word uh, citizen science, we just wanted to inform uh, as much as public we could reach, and um, also probably you said this, I was out with me here, but probably you said this during the show of uh, Johanna Hoffmann, the last show of the series, um, we had the uh, Macro Microbiologies Library, uh, where we just had all the source books then gathered and gave everyone a chance to actually come back again, and, and we were really delighted that it was used frequently, intensively. Right, and you know, with every exhibition, there are talks and other programs. We also give young artists talks, curators talks. Uh, interesting thing in the last few years is uh, uh, an interesting public of uh, arts makers scene, arts scene coming together, who are kind of looking for a place uh, to interact. And so uh, that's one public. We've had another public. It's the area we show has a lot of nonprofit art spaces. Uh, and then we have schools. We just last week had a, a tenth grade class come in uh, and did an hour and a half seminar with them. So uh, you know, so that's quite very a lot of uh, art art school groups that come to Berlin. Uh, we've done through you know sometimes we just get an email and sometimes it's people we work with and they're bringing their class. So it, it's it's quite varied there. Uh, and you know, but it's interesting that there's a. a there isn't a large art, science art public in Berlin, I would say, but it's growing. Uh, I think there's a lot of, the art crowd and the science crowd are very separated, but you know, there's beginning to be synergies. You know, I, I think maybe you might have hear it here, but I have a feeling that maybe London is a few years ahead on, on, on this curve.
We've got time for one last question. Uh, um, I was just wondering with uh, with the experiment like with the crayfish, whether um, whether that was originally led by um, something which, which was which the public was very aware of in the first instance, which you were using, or that the experiment was used as a platform on which to discuss the whole issue to do with invasive species in relationship to native species, and use that as a kind of metaphor for um, for working with that kind of idea, or whether or whether you were um, more um, uh, giving a platform for a piece of research which you was know, doing, whether it came from something which was already a question, say in your area, like it certainly is here in, in London, where you have American privilege, um, which is basically. Yeah, um, I, I think the, art, the artist started the project in the Slovene version uh, because it was something happening not only in Slovenia, but in near the town where she was born. And she would go back there, and then she met some scientists who were working there. She's done her her work is very much about uh, working on a project, but with this collaboration. Uh, there's a work she did on uh, on synthetic biology and genetic manipulation that's going to be shown at the ZKM uh, opening next week, and it's work from several years ago that's won several awards. And she did that together with, an, with a biochemist, uh, and it came from that. And she's done recent work that has to do with human, dog, wolf, you know. They, and she's worked with scientists in uh, France who are wolf specialists, and she's worked with biochemists to look at the biochemistry of dogs. Uh, so it, for her, the collaboration is interesting, but it's always uh, very important, and it's always a particular theme, I think. Um, for her, the invasive species theme came because it was something that was happening very much around, but it also touched, had a lot of touchstones. Uh, and, uh, and when we asked her about the possibility of showing it, she said, yes, but I can't do this local version in Germany, it doesn't make sense. And then we kind of worked off, connected her, we did research ourselves, found a, a specialist in crustacean in, based in Berlin, and you know, kind of from it, the work came from that collaboration. Um, <clears throat> there's a connection between her work and Brandon's in that it's kind of an awareness of, uh, you know, of environmental catastrophe and uh, you know, species collapse and, uh, uh, you know, it's very topical. Okay, thank you. And the art science scene may be small in Berlin, but you are leading the way and building that community educationally and in terms of collaboration and the public engagement and exhibition work. So. Yeah, Berlin Art Laboratory, Berlin Go See. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the opportunity to present the latest work that I've created over essentially the past year, year and a half. Uh, one good point to 2009 is the fulcrum of my current professional incarnation, as it was the year that I decided to turn a laundry room in my, into a home la uh, laboratory and began referring to myself as a biohacker. I began pursuing an intentionally, subversively chimeric experimental practice, initially based upon the appropriation of laboratory techniques or data into the production of artwork. Born of the Stars, a selenium-toned calotype, is an example of this early body of work. Through super superimposition of images taken at varied orders of magnitude, making use of both photomicroscopy and astrophotography, my aim was to disrupt preconceived notions of scale. Born of the Stars represents an evolutionary metamorphosis of the cosmos into myriad biological forms. This material connection between our bodies and celestial bodies has been a recurring theme uh, throughout my work. As a meteor passes through the upper atmosphere, it produces an ionization trail that reflects radio waves. This reflection can be detected using a standard FM radio receiver with, an, with the aid of an antenna. By capturing the trace of meteors falling toward the Earth, the interactive sculpture Echoes of Lucky Wakosh reminds us of our celestial origins and the muta mutability and the mutability of life on our natal, natal planet. 
At its core, Echoes of Lucky Wakosh is a reminder of our material connection to the broader universe, of our celestial origins, and the possibility of life burgeoning elsewhere. Moreover, it's an oral reminder of the permeability and mutability of our natal planet as it bathes in a continuous shower of extraterrestrial matter. In an attempt to directly reference the evolutionary connection spanning four billion years from celestial organic material into Homo sapiens, I developed a modified printing process that allowed me to produce photographic prints using my own blood. Based upon the 19th century albumin printing process that normally <coughs> utilizes egg whites to create the emulsion, I've instead chosen to substitute the serum from my freshly drawn whole blood. This series of human blood-derived albumin prints are called pernicie, alluding to their subject. I've inserted my biological material, a set of specific DNA sequences, into the digital image file um, and take the original digital file that was taken through a microscope into the interior crystalline structure of the meteorite, thereby altering or glitching its form. Therefore, Prometheus contained both the rudimentary composite material and the evolutionary fruits of extraterrestrial objects. Drawing upon Otto Steinert's concept of subjective photography and his drive to move photography beyond straightforward representation, I've begun my own experimentations not only with the medium through which the image is produced, but exploring ref uh, the reflexivity within the subject matter itself. Produced through the combination of my blood with various, quote, and I'll add the quotes to that, natural substances, and recorded using only a hacked webcam for a microscope, Corpus Brandiferum considers the body as terrain for exploration and exploitation. Through extrapolation, it can be seen as both a satellite or God's eye view of our planet, as well as a metaphor for our material relationship with the Earth. The imagery is produced as my blood either mixes or resists the addition of exogenous natural material, 
such as metals, pigments, and resins. A series of moving images capture the ebb and flow of my red blood cells through this surreal landscape, accompanied by the oral compositions they've inspired. In permutation one, blood cells defy gravity, streaming through flakes of copper oxide upward, reaching toward the heavens. at Symbiotica earlier this year provided me with access to a DIC or differential interference contrast microscope. Placed under a DIC scope, this chimeric mix of blood and terrestrial matter transformed further into abstract landscapes with unprecedented depth. With a syringe full of my freshly drawn blood in hand, admittedly a common scene in my studio practice, I play with the chemolumogram process, experimenting with the effects I can produce by controlling the flow of blood through the needle and the way in which the blood reacts to the emulsion on an array of photographic papers. Inspired by an exhibition of cyclone paintings I had stumbled upon in Basel, I began to likewise experiment with, quote, excessive coloration and gesture, quote, from the exhibition catalog. I was particularly drawn to the way in which his work elicits a sense of carelessness or defilement. It was, pardon me, it was Twombly's untitled 1961 Roma and a coincidental residency that led me to Rome that provoked this response to his work as a series of experiments that bring post-abstract expressionism into photographic printmaking. It may have been my academic training in biomedical research that cultivated in me a tolerance for the unique smells and textures of biomaterials, but it was joining the biohacking movement that afforded me the freedom to question what I had taken for granted and approach the techniques and materials with, uh, with which I'd grown so familiar with fresh eyes and open mind. Initially conceived as a method of stripping aged or diseased cells from a donor organ in order to, sorry, it's quite bright, uh, uh, from a donor organ in order to regenerate it using new cells. <coughs> collaborator Amy Congdon and I have appropriated decellularization into a creative practice. 
Once an organ or tissue is stripped of its cellular material, only the extracellular matrix remains containing the proteins such as collagen and elastin that comprise the architecture of the organ. Within the context of biomedical research, uh, the D-cell process prepares a scaffold to receive with stem cells, uh, the objective being the full regeneration and restoration of the tissue's original function. Our collective work proffers decellularization or decellularized flesh as material in its own right uh, to be experimented with and to push it to its aesthetic limits. For decellular, uh, for decellular I designed a set of glass vessels that would allow us to carry out the protocol within a gallery setting. Since the debut of decellular in 2013, I've continued to experiment with decell in my own practice as a process of dematerializing, of devitalizing what was once part of a living being in preparation for its biophysical resurrection. Within a bespoke glass vessel sits a fully preserved decellularized heart, the talitas, is the antithesis of the memento mori, representing the obsolescence of my body. The decellularized heart it contains sits in place of my own until the moment of its programmed disembodiment. The sculptural form of the talitas is intended to serve as a vessel, a vessel to memorialize an organ that was once part of my being and carried me through to the point where it could be rendered superfluous to the extant constituents of my body. <clears throat> Revealing that which is deepest within us, penetralia, unpacks the obscure, the obscure itself. The vibrant colors of histological stains illuminate the anatomy of our impulsivity and disgust as segments of a decelled porcine bowel are laid bare in a manner that is raw and visceral. Stellar, that most brilliant of cyborgs with a contagious laugh, uh, once used that to him, quote, the body is an imperson impersonal, evolutionary, objective structure. Having spent 2,000 years prodding and poking the human psyche without any real discernible changes in our historical and human outlook, perhaps we need to take a more fundamental physiological and structural approach and consider the fact that it's only through radically redesigning the body that we will end up having significantly different thoughts and philosophies. The present trajectory of my own work attends to the body as a contested space, contextualized within a contemporary expanded definition of body boundaries, thus expanding upon the work of other contemporary artists who likewise dissect the complexities of our modern relationship with our own biomaterials. Marking time found roots in the alternate anatomy's laboratory at Curtin, owing to the overwhelming generosity of stellar communicellars. The title is intended to reference both the military notion of marking time, to march in the same place yet not move in any one direction, as well as a sense of encapsulating a moment. A series of synthetic meteorites, my talisman and emblem of our extraterrestrial provenance, will contain my biological material carefully preserved and archived. Through marking time, I proffer a material legacy that is interwoven with the natural history and narrative of my body over what remains of my, li my lifetime. <clears throat> Ostensibly secular contemporary ideologies proffer an alternate path to salvation that is entirely self-determined, arguably relativistic, abjures the supernatural, and for most, the salvation, an immortal state free of suffering, can be attained through biotechnological conversion to a post-human state, or at least sustaining one's corporeal being through constant regeneration. Bennu, uh, the recent work, um, is ash made of my blood, and it awaits material resurrection. It marks the beginning of a planned obsolescence of my own body, and its rebirth into new incarnations. <clears throat> to frame the direction of my work, a ceaseless revision of my material being towards multiple forms, incarnations, and potentialities, I compose the Manifesto of Transfiguration. It begins with a dismissal of our present fallible biological state, echoing the beginning of uh, Valentin Sanquan's Manifesto of the Futurist Woman 
claiming all humanity is mediocre. At its core, transfiguration is a call for the individual and all those of like mind to seek apotheosis through the pursuit of techne, in the platonic sense of the word, virtuous practice or knowing through making. Directing our imagination and creative impulse toward our own corporeal essence by eschewing all that is normal, facile, or ordinary, and bravely pursuing that which is extraordinary and perhaps irrational to the common man. It is possible to experience a more profound, expanded connection with and through our bodies, thus enabling us to more fully engage with our natal universe. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to read it for you now and hope that it might encourage provocative discourse. Hmm. I can get it to scroll down. Nature, and by extension the human body, is mediocre and deserving of scorn. It is not the product of supernatural design, but rather probability, and therefore merits no intrinsic reverence or devotion. The schism between, quote, natural and, quote, synthetic is artifice. Whether made by the hands of humankind or other beings, forces, all matter is formed by the same fragmentary constituents of our cosmos. As a species, Humans have developed an impulse to find meaning out of seeming disorder, and from this impulse is born our search for purpose and the transcendental. Such an impulse can be as destructive, is destructive as much of this as it is powerful, yet it must be cultivated in the search of our own apotheosis. It is only through the advancement of techne that apotheosis can be attained, for what is technology but an attempt to ameliorate insufficiency? The quest for apotheosis merits abhorrence for the ordinary and an aversion to convention. Rather, our deliverance lies in the singular, the aberration, the impossible. Uniformity breeds mundanity, the perdition from which we seek salvation. Trans uh, transcendence must be sought in every aspect of our existence, the material, the spiritual, the cerebral, the emotional, and that which is revered as sacred, sublime, and worthy of our devotion must abjure a sense of familiarity. Ours is an aesthetic devoted to the exceptional, the irrational, the preposterous. Okay, thank you, Jaden. Fantastic. So, the manifesto, tell us a little bit more about its origins and, and, as, and is that experience, that's something you developed some time ago. Yeah, yeah. Has it kind of refined? Do you revisit it? How does it help the relationship between the manifesto and the work and the practices? So I think forming the manifesto back when, during that period of intensive research academically in the MA, helped me begin to create the framework through which my current and future practice would manifest itself. Um, it was really interesting to go back to that original manifesto and reflect upon the course of the past year and a half, and how I, that that um, that philosophical base has informed um, the experimentation that I've, I've pursued. Yeah. And working processes, obviously, a, a huge journey between an intuitive mark making, exploring different materials, a kind of the, the, significant laboratory processes which take an incredible amount of rigour to understand and, and um, manifest to hack and to hack. How, how do you navigate that space between different methods and practices? Tell us a little bit more about that. So, uh, in terms of inspiration, sometimes it begins like with Pernichier and with Echoes of the Push, it begins with the idea, the concept, I want to find the best way to encapsulate um, the, the concepts behind it. But much of the time, it's simply, uh, how can I re-envision, how can I reinterpret um, an existing protocol um, in a new way that might reveal a bit about what the, the action of the person doing it. Uh, it so it becomes an <coughs> excessively reflexive experience. So therefore, I, I, 
it's recursive. You know, I take someone else's protocol, I hack it, incorporate my own techniques, my own concepts behind it, and then reflect upon the doing. And it's, it's a huge philosophical yes. <laughs> endeavor as well. Um, how? What's the question to do with it? <laughs> Anyone got a question on the philosophical endeavour? <laughs> Anyone got a question? Lots of people. Have. Okay, I'm going to pass it over. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Rico. Thank you. I'm a great fan of your work, so I'm delighted to be here. And uh, what suddenly occurred to me, uh, seeing the bowl of ash that you showed us just now, was that there is a relationship that people have with the matter in their body that is sort of goes through death. And so one talks about you know, ashes to ashes. You can imagine yourself as being whatever molecules you are or atoms you are before you're born, and then somehow they become food, and then they become ingested by your mother, and you become what you are, and then you eat, and you continue. And that's sort of your relationship with matter. And then finally, you die, and then you become ash, or you you know, you go into the ground or you get put in a cremation, sort of whatever it is. But there's something that you're doing that is subverting that very traditional course. And I was wondering whether that's something, how, how do you think about that in terms of, you know, if you just take somebody that's a normal person, has this traditional relationship with the matter in their body, and you're doing something very different. And how do they relate to each other or not relate to each other? And what are you trying, if you're trying to investigate or break or subvert? Mm. What, is it something that, that is part of your practice, that element of it? I mean, it, perhaps because I am dealing with notions of salvation, immortality, there is that search for transcendence. So, um, maybe trying to stage my death in advance, <laughs> if I could see it as such. But um, I think, for me, the, the broader scope is, is developing an intimacy inside and out with my own body. Um, and, I, yeah, becoming comfortable with my body in perhaps a way that most people are not. Yeah. But this, this is a good point. I, um, honestly, when I'm working, I don't really think about what other people are thinking about what I'm doing. For me, it's an action for myself. Um, so I, I am interested in these bubble forums to hear a response to what I'm doing to my body, um, and perhaps how it could be viewed by others. And I think that came across when you were talking about that reflexive process. Um, between you and the, pr the processes that you're undertaking, the materials and, the, and the, the, those philosophical considerations that are, are, are imbued within that. So, this is the opportunity to get yeah. other responses to step out of that self <laughs> There's a question here. Thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting indeed. Um, this word hacking we've heard many times this evening already implies a sort of processual engagement with the objects we're engaging with. And as we've already discussed here, the corporeality is the thing that, that inspires such a process. Um, I'm interested when you are talking about um, the fragment. The corporeality is, is a different sort of fragment in some ways, because we're thinking in, in physical sense, in the kind of biomedical sense, of a sort of um, Deleuzean input-output schema. You know, we have a sort of the flow of these things, so the blood comes out, and so the process that happens to it. Um, assuming your techne is a sort of Heideggerian techne of, of process as well, does that perhaps um, question, or maybe another way to put it, how does that place your um, questioning of external bodies, of, for mm -hmm. example, celestial bodies, in the process, and how does that maybe question those two works within your practice? Well, I think, I think the external body is another side topic that I explore quite a bit in my work, the sort of medicalized body of the biologi biological, uh, biotechnological era. Um, when I was in India, I had a rather uh, fascinating dis uh, discussion uh, that occurred over a period of time uh, with my colleagues that practice Vipassana Yoga. For those that aren't familiar, it's a rather intensive practice where you become 
intensely aware of your body um, and ideally forming some sort of control of it, but it's, a, it's an entirely subjective understanding and uh, relationship with the physical state of your body. Um, as opposed to what I am most familiar with, especially in allopathic medicine, an externalized understanding of the body, where physicians, the medical staff, biomedical researchers have a better understanding of my own body than I do. So this was a, a rather fascinating juxtaposition that I'd like to explore further, but I find this, I, I'll think about it further uh, relating to extraterrestrial objects and that connection. I find it more as a, a way to show the link, that deep time link between the celestial objects and my body specifically, but our bodies collectively. Um, I'll think about it further in terms of external, internal, um, in out relationships. But I do find um, you brought up the external body and that triggered another sort of side discourse to my work. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, John from Jewel, I was saying that I was on the art theory and philosophy course by only two weeks in. I didn't actually understand most of the deep details. It's just going to be interesting. <laughs> I won't be able to say it. Um, I just actually was interested. You, you started off in bio, bio uh, medicine, bioinformatics yeah, and stuff. I have two degrees in biology and biomedicine. Okay. Well, what is interesting, a very simple question, it's a bit personal, is when did you first look down the microscope or see some blood or maybe it was a kick, yeah, it's maybe a patch of blood. When did it, you looked at that and thought, wow, there's art in this? Mm. Uh, I was wondering how that sort of light influenced you coming on this break. Uh, as to how it, how it influenced me to join that and art and science? Or? Well, I guess how you ultimately ended up here. Uh. But I guess from my point of view, <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's extensive, isn't it? Uh, no, I meant how you ultimately <laughs> ended up on the programme and yeah. beyond the programme. <laughs> kind of or like when you saw the art in science. Yeah. When did I see the art in science? Yes. At what point did you sort of like look down and say, you know what? You know, honestly, I never really saw a schism between art and science. My, my understanding of what art is has definitely evolved as I become a professional artist. Okay. Um, and certainly as I unlace the corset that biomedical research has put upon me as a scientist. I see some other from there. Um, so loosening my, my understanding of science as a practice, as a, a practice of experimentation, rather than a didactic ingraining of knowledge. Um, so when did I first see the art in my practice? I, honestly, that, that's an evolving <laughs> thing. In fact, I often question in my own practice, um, this is art. Um, but uh, truthfully, I've always just had this curiosity that I've had to find both through art and science, starting with music into sciences and back out into visual arts. Um, so it's, for me, it's always been intertwined, personal. Are those modes, I, I assume that sometimes they are in conflict? Absolutely, yeah. Because and we're talking about two different value that? systems, right? You, you have two completely different value systems, and so oftentimes I find myself framing the way I describe my work depending on who I'm speaking to. Because you have to speak in terms of the values of science, um, which is a shared experience, shared understanding of truth, versus art, which is a very subjective, very personal, ancestral <coughs> experience um, that can be shared. So I often have to frame it in my boxes of art and science. Um, yeah. And within your own reflexive process, yeah. how do you deal with those conflicts? <laughs> Not the externalizing yeah. You know, presenting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I honestly try and find a way to mix them as best I can. So I'm not necessarily approaching. Like, for example, this project, The Matter of Humanist, started as um, a scientific investigation. It was a bioinformatic project that I found rather fascinating on a philosophical level. Um, so that evolved into um, the production of artwork. So, I guess sometimes it starts with um, a scientific uh, idea um, development, sometimes, protocol uh, that I latch onto and try and push into uh, some sort of project that, that can capture it um, with, a, with a completely different context. We've got time for one or two. Um, well, 
I was going to ask, uh, I was actually going to ask you originally to whether you could explain this, uh, this last slide. Um, and one of the things which occurs to me is something to do with this funny um, lapse between art and science, and whether whether the whether the fact that it resembles um, a, a whole area of modernist artwork justifies the science, or whether the science justifies the art. I actually wonder what, what the conversation between the two is, because um, because we are we're, we're looking at something which immediately looks very familiar. Like you're talking about Saturn, um, and you think, oh, this is familiar, and then you see it's, it's blood or whatever. Is that oh, it's unfamiliar? Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think that kind of funny lacuna is something which I think perhaps would be good to you know would be good to hear about. Yeah, perhaps using a touchstone that's familiar in one that moves into a different context. Um, so this project, I, I think you're probably re referring to Richter, right? Uh, this does look very familiar to those in the art world, uh, but in fact, it's scientific data that I've uh, developed a visual heuristic for visualizing protein structure. Um, so in these images are actually three of the proteins that I study. And these proteins happen to be three proteins that distinguish us, materially speaking, from every other, extra, uh, every other terrestrial being. They're, they're uniquely human proteins. So as to, I mean, I'm interested to hear your response from what I've just heard about this. Um, well, I think, I, I think the interesting thing there is that somehow the integrity of the object, does that then, is that then a corroboration of the integrity of the structures you're, you're discussing? You know, it's, it's actually, it actually goes straight to the heart of what you're talking about, is, it, is, is, is um, a poetics of the whole process, which I, I, I think I, I find, um, you know, very, quite moving, really. I'd and, and, um, well, be interested to hear um, how you're defining integrity. Integrity and... and the okay. I, I, I think, well, in the history of art, the, 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 one of the things which is very defining is this aspiration towards integrity. You know the integrity of the art object, meaning that it doesn't refer to anything else outside of it. And then suddenly, where you, what you've done is you've turned it on its head, and you've you've used somehow um, the idea of the art object, which which is abstract. It doesn't have to refer to anything else outside of it. Suddenly, it's a reference. It's, it becomes a code again, um, which I, I think is. Um, you know, it, what it does is it, is it, uh, is it points out the fallacy of the idea of the artwork which has integrity because obviously in order to read any artwork you have to bring your baggage to it. Um, and, uh, and so you know that the art object which has integrity automatically is, um, begs, begs more questions than it answers. Um, and so, so that idea that it's a, that hey yes it's also a code um, by decoding it, um, you have this funny um, dilemma that you're no longer living in the artwork. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. so it's a, it's, a, it's a problematic, you know, what perhaps... How much those... to reveal of the origins of the, of the concept of the idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Right. Well, Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about transcendence. <laughs> because because well, it's, it's, yeah, in my mind it's a very, um, let's say, broad concept in that there are lots of views on it. <laughs> and, and I was particularly curious in hearing what you have to say about transcendence and the materiality yeah. that that is ingrained in your work, and the materiality um, carrying material matter and becoming, let's say, mortal. No, I, I think I think you're touching on something that you know it's perhaps I don't know, 
paradoxical. That it's, that it's, that it's meant to be something that is there's a material body. turned immaterial. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, in a way, it's it's um, it's not becoming metaphysical, <laughs> um, at least materially speaking. <laughs> um, but instead, I think my objects are meant to transcend my own body. So um, mm -hmm. transcending one object into another. So rather than perhaps a traditional um, theological understanding of transcendence, this is more material transcendence. Mm -hmm. That perhaps one could argue that's transfiguration. But that's a, that's a yeah. you know, <laughs> that's an ontological question that needs to be parsed. Thank you. Burning question or comment? Okay, well, we'll go home with those considerations of transcendence and transfiguration on our mind. And maybe, JJ, you could come back in a year's time and finish on the next episode of trying to, to make your body obsolete. Yeah. So, and obsolescent. <laughs> we'll, we'll do a time lapse. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, JJ.